Every company has difference makers, the people who go above and beyond what's required. This podcast is dedicated to the people who challenge the status quo and make good companies great. Today, we're sharing one story from one company in our effort to inspire others. Welcome to Difference Makers, episode 17. Today, my guest is Scott Love. Scott is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and served in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer. Um, I met Scott when he was a recruiting industry trainer and speaker back in the, I think it was the late 90s, 2000s. And he has spoken at my company and played a part in the growth of many of the search executives that I employed in the early 2000s. My firm placed over $4 billion in repeat annual loan production with national lenders, but it was Scott that really helped open the vault to their thinking about how to actually make these cold calls to people they didn't know. And to me, that's a lost art in my mind, even today. Uh, Scott has been an influencer, uh, an agent of change, and in short, a difference maker. And he continues to be a difference maker today. Scott is passionate about inspiring professionals to reach full potential and expand their influence and impact. He speaks professionally on the topic of positive influence in the workplace. He is an author of Why They Follow, How to Lead with Positive Influence, and he co-authored Rainmaker Confidential. He's a producer of his own podcast, also called Rainmaker, uh, excuse me, The Rainmaking Podcast. And then if that wasn't enough, Scott owns and operates a very successful legal executive search firm. Uh, Scott, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jim. This is great to see you. This is fantastic. I don't know how you find the time to be on this uh, broadcast with everything I just went through. I want to hang out with sharp, cool people like you, Jim. <laughs> okay. Hey, I, if it's okay, I'd like to kind of go way back and ask you, uh, how did you get into the recruiting business? Yeah, sure. I, I was in the Navy, and then I got into sales. And I'll never forget this. I was selling telecom this is in the mid 90s mm -hmm. in Asheville, north carolina and i was with the regional what they call regional inter-exchange carrier that was selling long distance and i was the number one sales rep in a 17 county area there were two of us and the other one wasn't very good mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was number one and i really loved sales and this company sent us to a two-week intensive training uh, session it was two weeks we went off site stayed in a hotel we learned how to sell mm -hmm. a commodity at prices higher than our competitors. And I fell in love with sales. And the office next to ours was a recruiting firm. And I'll never forget this. They said, if you do really well in recruiting, you can make over $40,000 a year. And I thought, I'm never going to have this chance. I've got to do this. And my first day on the job, this is July of 1995. I fell in love with it because I like the fact that I'm talking to executives who were twice my age at the time and I'm earning their trust. And I'm talking to individuals that are thinking about making a move. Maybe they're not sure. And I can introduce them to an organization that can help them get where they want to go. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I knew I'd do it for a very long time. I find I it fascinating stopped. and interesting that you found it fascinating and interesting to be in a, to be in a, in, in a, in a profession that make most people wildly uncomfortable and very, very right. uncomfortable. Uh, what was it about the sales piece or executive search, calling people, trying to get their trust, people you don't know, people that you've never met? What was it that attracted you? Whereas most, there, I would say most people would not be attracted to something like that. Right. I think it's because I am making a difference. I think all of us in some way, we want to be significant. We want to say, I did that. I was recruiting at the time people in construction and they would tell me that they would take their kids to the job sites and show them the building and say, look, I built that. Mm -hmm. I contributed to that. And it's nice when I can look at all the people that I placed, all the organizations I've developed and some of my clients, they're my closest friends. We play golf, we have dinner with our wives mm -hmm. and they depend on me. And I cherish that, Jim. I absolutely cherish that. Knowing that I was the one that opened up the door for this successful person to come in and help that organization solve its biggest strategic challenge. I was the guy that opened up the door. Mm -hmm. So, and I know you're like that too. Mm -hmm. And you know, the money's good, you know, it's it, And as you know, when it's good, it's really good. And when it's bad, it's really bad <laughs> and it's really bad, but the opportunity is there. So I think, I think that's what motivates me, Jim, is knowing that 
well, just like the name of your show, which is such a great name, I'm a difference maker. Uh, the core values of my recruiting firm is influence, impact, and integrity. We know that we can influence people, we can make an impact, and we do it in a way mm -hmm. that we sleep really well at night. Uh, I love this show called American Greed. Have you ever seen I that I love before? that show. Absolutely. I do too. And you see these people that go through all this effort to earn the trust of people and then, in a bad way, exploit it mm -hmm. for selfish gain. And I love the idea of having this code of, I'm not going to do anything unless it helps the other person first, and sticking by that code, and earning that trust, and then serving them. And you get Christmas cards, you get uh, people that remember you, because you made a difference. And I think if we look at Abraham Maslow, the hierarchy of needs, self-actualization, and also we want to be recognized. And even if we're not recognized by a lot of people just knowing that we made that difference, I think that's part of the human a human need, Jim. And I think that's what keeps our society going forward. When people, uh, and I learned this in Scouts, I did the whole thing from uh, Bobcat to Eagle, did the whole thing. And you take the Scout slogan, do a good turn daily. It becomes a habit. And I think that in itself is a cleansing ritual. It cleanses us from all the other garbage in our lives and it gives us healing. It gives us strength when we give to other people, when we serve them. That's the end of my seminar. I <laughs> Fantastic. Well, well said. Seminars over. Well, Thanks. well Thanks said. Coming, About as well said as I've ever heard. I, I guess my my question is like, how? I mean, are we just wired? Are we either wired this way, or are we not wired that way? Or is it something that you that influenced you? Was it something in the Navy that influenced you? Was it something in your childhood that influenced you to want to be a difference maker? I think for me, and I'll never forget this in high school. And I, I grew up really poor. My family had no money, and they made it very clear if you ever want to go to college, you, you know, help yourself. <laughs> and with all, you know, bless their hearts, they didn't have the resources. And I remember talking with the high school counselor, and I'll never forget seeing this uh, poster in her office. And it's not getting religious or anything, but the poster said, the talents that you have are God's gift to you. What you do with them is your gift back to God. And that stuck with me. So for me, in a lot of ways, it's almost like a spiritual walk where, uh, not like I'm trying to get preachy or anything like that, but for me, that's my gratitude exercise. I want to see how far I can go. I don't want to squander any resources I have or any gifts that I have. I want to see how far I can go as my way to say thank you. And I think, I think the way we're wired, we need each other. We need to be around other people. And this is something I'd realized about two years ago that selflessness is a very attractive quality. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can deny ourselves in service of other people, that's attractive to other people. And uh, I remember when I was at the academy, we couldn't leave the yard except on the weekends. And if you snuck out during the week, you'd get demerits and I already had too many demerits. So I would find ways that I could get out of the yard, the academy during the week and you could go do service projects. I'll never forget Wednesday evenings, we could go sing at the old folks' home. We go sing at the old folks' home. The nurses were really nice and everybody was really nice to us there. And there's this one couple that had been married for 60 years. And I remember just sitting there and hearing their story. And I asked the husband, his wife had had a stroke and he was there visiting her. He said, 60 years. I said, sir, what's the secret? And he said, son, it's give and take, but mostly give. And that just really... It really struck me significantly. I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's the kind of life I want to live. And that's a really good business strategy, Jim. And I know that you know that. Mm -hmm. Give and take, but mostly give. Mm -hmm. Anytime I'm talking to anybody, let me give you something. Here's a link to my podcast, or here's a resource for you, or something like that. And I think that's, that's attractive to people. That puts you in that position of trust. People are going to trust you when they know that it's not the Scott show. It's not the Jim show. It's about them. Uh, when I recruit, I tell every candidate I'm working with, I work a with a pre pretty sophisticated group of people. I work with uh, partners of global law firms. I say, my goal is to channel your self-interests so it intersects with law firm strategy. And if what I present to you isn't a fit, it's not going to hurt my feelings. Just be honest with me. And I think people appreciate that. I think they appreciate the honesty. I think knowing that they're working with someone that cares, that really cares, and somebody that wants to make a difference. I think I think that's a critical part of success in anything, Jim. For sure. 
Absolutely. I've always said, put the client's interest first, do the right thing. Yeah. Don't, don't ever be in this to chase the buck. The money always comes if you do the right thing, yeah. you know, and it right. magically finds the business magically finds its way to you when you're a good person and you're selfless and you take care of people. And some of my best friends are my clients now uh, that, right. that we've made. That's great. How, I'm not surprised. How did you, how did you find your way to this niche to legal? Why attorneys? Well, I had built a training company in 2002, and that's where I met you. I would train recruiting firms all over the country. I would do global training events every once in a while, but I've trained a lot. I've had over 4,500 recruiting and staffing companies over the years wow. that invested in my resources. Yeah, 36 countries. And so some of them were legal recruiters. And I was thinking about getting back into recruiting because I personally don't like being a coach. I like being a hunter. I like, I'm a hunter, not a farmer. I like closing the deal. I like making that placement and ringing the bell and saying, look what I built, look what I did, mm -hmm. more than coaching people. Yeah. And so I wanted to get out of my training business and I eventually sold it a few years ago, but a lot of the people I was consulting to were in the legal industry. And I really liked that. I was on the debate team in high school and in college at the Naval Academy. I like sparring intellectually with smart people. I just love that. And it was a really good fit. It was tough for me to really learn that for the first two years, I didn't bill anything. But then after that, I started doing partners. I've done mergers. I've had some really good years. I've had some really bad years, but it's good. You know, it's a good niche. We recruit partners with uh, top 100, top 50, top 200 firms. Then recently I launched an associate division that's working with my clients. There's about 18 different firms that we've got pretty good rapport with. I've met with over 60 firms in their offices. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a niche. And as you know, that when you get mastery in something, there's no end to how much you can learn. There's no end to how involved you can get in that. So I've been able to have some successful marketing initiatives. I'm on the board of a trade association of legal recruiters. And it's just great to have that market mastery in a niche that is very enjoyable. We talked briefly about it a minute ago, but I wanted to just kind of go back over it. Are there any lessons or skills that you feel I and mean, we didn't talk specifically about the service, but Navy, maybe in the Navy that helped you mm -hmm. in business or in civilian life? I think it was earning trust and earning respect yeah. mm -hmm. because you have the authority when you're on active duty, you're an officer in the Navy. Every sailor has to do what you say because you're the boss of them, but that's not enough. And in seeing how sailors responded that, and I was on a ship with some pretty tough sailors, Jeff. I mean, these guys were rough. They were salty. Uh, never forget, I mean, several of them, they would have like naked lady mermaid tattoos on their arms. I mean, these guys were tough. And the thing I loved was earning their trust. I didn't have to earn their friendship. I didn't care if they liked me or not, but I really enjoyed leading in a way that you earned their respect. And that's something that you have to earn. Mm -hmm. It's not given, you have to earn that and it takes time. And I, I apply that to my business development skills, to my rainmaking concepts, that there's a reason why people will follow you. There's a reason why they will comply. And rule number one, just like I taught your team years ago, people are going to do what's in their own best interests. You need to find out what that is. So people also need to understand how do they fit in with the big picture. I'll never forget, I had this one sailor. He was a sonar technician. We were on a, on a, on a minesweeper where the sonar was back from the 1950s. This is during Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. And I had to tell him, you've got to spend another weekend here and get the sonar fixed. And I could just tell him, you got to do it because I'm the boss of you. I'm the officer. You're the sonar technician. You're the sailor. You got to do this. Mm -hmm. I could do that. Mm -hmm. But I said, Petty Officer Shaper, come into my state. Have a seat. Let's talk about this. As you know, the Iraqis have invaded Kuwait. As you know, we're the next minesweeper to rotate to the Gulf. We can't get to it because we have our sea trials. The fleet can't get in the harbor because of the mines that are there. If we don't get our sea trials finished, we can't go over there. Right now, our ship is the most important ship in the fleet. Right now, you're the most important, ship, most important sailor in the Navy because you need to get that sonar fixed and I need you to stay here this weekend and do it. Yes, sir. I told him, this is how you matter. Mm. This is the context 
of purpose aligning with mission accomplishment. And it just takes a little bit of time. I think explaining things to people, listening to them. I mean, I would listen to my sailors say, great. And I'd say, no, we're not doing that. I want you to know I heard you. I understand what you told me and I heard you. But no, we're not doing that. This is what we're doing. And just developing the empathy, developing the trust, listening to them. I think that was the biggest thing I learned, Jim, was that there's a reason why people do things. People are uh, intrinsically motivated by something. You need to find out what that is and lead to that. That's what I learned from the Navy. Difference Makers is powered by Verity Search. In today's competitive war for talent, they understand recruiting requires having a strong sales and marketing approach. Recruiting is not posting jobs online and waiting for unqualified people to apply. It's active, it's engaging, and it's working with people while maintaining extreme confidentiality. Their solutions and techniques are innovative and brave, but based on industry knowledge and key identification strategies. Some of the key services include strategy planning, research, marketing, prospect identification, qualification, and recruitment across all markets and geographies. If you'd like more information, please check out the website at veritysearch.com. So something I know about you to be true, and we we alluded to it earlier, was your desire to make a difference and create positive change. And we talked a little bit about, you know, where does that come from? And you talked about, um, you know, how good it feels to give and, and, and some of the things that we want to be connected to as human beings. But what do you think drives you to win? Because that's something else. Knowing that I did my very best. That's all I care about. Knowing, and it's almost like a game in my mind, where uh, how much can I get done? And here's an example. I have a tool, and I don't know if I have it here. It's called a time timer. I may have put it away, but it's like a 15-minute device, Uh 30 minutes, 45 minutes. I can set it for 15, 30 minutes. Let's see how much work I can get done in the next 15 minutes. I'll play little games throughout the day before I leave. You know what? I'm going to make one more call before I leave. It's time for me to go. It's 5.30. I've got to leave. I'm just going to pick up the phone and dial one more. I still remember a lot of that from you, from the training that you did for my people. I still remember some of that. In fact, I still have your call tracker. uh, Oh, yeah, that's right. Call tracker sheet. Yeah, we still, I still pull that out from time to time if I want to go old school on these guys. That's it. Um, and, 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 and even I think. And, and we, my, uh, excuse me, my partner and I talked about this uh, two days ago, Jeff. And he said, you know, to this day, I still remember Scott Love talking about before you do anything, when you sit down, before you go get a coffee, before you shuffle a paper, make a phone call, break the yeah. ice. That's what I did this morning when I came in. I don't even boot up my email. I don't get my coffee. I bring up my database. I'm going to call one guy. I called him, left him voicemail. I'm going to go get my coffee. Mm. Yesterday, I did that. I didn't get my coffee until 1130, Jim. (laughs) I came in. I'm ready to go at 9 o'clock. And I didn't get my coffee until 1130 because I just made one call. It's like, I mean, I like that feeling. Mm. If you think about why we do things, we do things because of feelings. I want to feel good. That's why people drink, take drugs. Hey, I like to drink. I don't do drugs, but I like to drink. You feel good. I like to work out. I like to play golf. I like to spend time with my wife. I like to win. I think the answer to that question is I like to win. It feels good to win. Mm-hmm. It feels good to know I can go to bed, clear conscience, knowing I made a difference in other people's lives with the expectation that I'm going to win tomorrow. And a lot of that is work I had to do with self-esteem, things I've talked about in my training uh, business where the self-esteem, the self-sabotage. I went through issues of getting so close to the deal, and I'd self-sabotage the deal because I didn't feel like I deserved it. My self-image wasn't up here; it's down here. Yeah. So that's work that I had to do, Jim, yeah. just to get to that point where I could say I deserve to win because I did the work. Yeah. One of my mentors um, in the business, he's passed away now, but Bruce Kuiper is a guy that, when I first went on my own, he was so generous with his time and mentoring me even today I still hear some of the things he taught me over and over in my head but 
I made a I made a fee with a client, and at the time it was the largest fee I'd ever billed. It was it was only like sixty thousand, but it was one of the highest ones I'd ever done. And I had I was sweating over sending the invoice because I know that I had made one phone call and did this yeah. deal, and and I just felt like I didn't deserve that. I didn't I didn't earn that. I didn't I didn't sweat hard enough. I didn't pay the price. It didn't last two months. It we didn't go through five hundred candidates. I just knew who the right person was. Called them. And the deal yeah. happened. And I called him and, and I said, I'm really sweating over sending this. And I, I, I don't know what he said. Jim, stop. Time out. First of all, you do deserve it. How many searches or assignments have you worked on in your career that came to no fruition whatsoever right. that didn't amount to anything? And he said, don't ever, don't ever hesitate about sending out a fee uh, to a client when you have a contract that you've both signed, that you both agreed to you know, that spells out the terms of your relationship and how could you ever be judged a bad guy for, for following the terms of the That's contract? Right. That's right. Um, and That's right. he said, and I'm going to tell you this one thing and never forget it. Don't ever um, underestimate what you do for a living because what you do is hard for a lot of people to do. And what they do may be harder for someone else to do. But just because it's easier for you, you've put in all of the time and the effort to get to that point in your career. And so from that point forward, I, I just, I completely did a 180 and turned the, I, I feel like my career sort of turned the corner there. And I said, you know what? He's right. I'm going to value my time. And, and that's it, great advice. Jim. And at that point, I think advice. we moved, we even moved to more retained search at that point too, because it's just yeah. like, he's right. You know, he's absolutely right. You know, I've earned my place. Um, Absolutely. You know, you solve that problem. Right. How much is that key worth that un unlocks the door to where the pile of money is? Right. Right. How much is a key worth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, the client obviously is benefiting, you know, financially in a major way uh, because of this guy coming on and leading that division. But, um, you know, you, you don't you don't always see the big picture when you're younger and you're just, you know, right. and you're just you're kind of trying to ascend to that level, get outside your box and try to really, you know, grow your career. Um, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. Um, so how, I want to ask you, how has recruiting evolved in your mind since you started and you've been in it, gosh, as long as I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say number one, you've got tech tools that make it a lot easier. Back when you and I started, everybody was a passive candidate because you didn't know who was active because there were no job boards because there was no internet mm -hmm. except for monster. And that was what? 96, something like that. Mm -hmm. But you, you, maybe AOL had a, had, a, had a job board, who knows? But there was no way to determine who was actively looking, who was on the market. Mm -hmm. Everybody was passive. Right. And I think coming into the industry back then it gave you good sales skills. That's one change, obviously, technology. I think, secondly, the expectation. People expect headhunters to call them. Companies expect to pay fees. It's not like you have to educate people on what our industry is anymore. It's permeated in pretty much all industries. Pretty much every industry has people in our profession that do it. And I would say number three is that uh, someone, someone asked me on a Facebook group, what is your most effective and favorite technology tool of recruiting? I know. The telephone. <laughs> that, was my, that was my answer. Because it gives you immediate contact with individuals directly, mm -hmm. and you're building a relationship with an emotional context to it. Mm -hmm. And if they give you an answer right then, no delay, you can respond. <laughs> and the more it's changed, the more it stayed the same. I'll never forget this. Right before I sold my training business, which I sold it about six years ago, just because I, I was going to flip the light switch off and there was a uh, new jersey based it staffing company the owner was from india he had people in his office that were from india that were recruiting people in it mm -hmm. and he even had a satellite office in india recruiting people all over the world in it mm -hmm. and he hired me to teach his people telephone communication skills because he saw that as a competitive advantage how do you talk to someone over the phone how do you get them to trust you? Just the subtleties of nuance of communication. How do you know when it's too soon to overcome an objection? Because nobody's doing that, especially in IT. It was all clicky, clicky, clicky. 
uh, let me send out an invite and see what they say. There's no emotional context to that. There are some tools that try to create that and, and props to them if they can do that. But he saw that person-to-person -person contact is a competitive advantage. Investing in the skills, it's a skill. You know that. You learned it. I learned it. It's a skill. It can be learned. How do you talk to people over the telephone in business? How you were able to take what is instinctive to me and instinctive to you and break it down into a process that can be taught is amazing to me because that's not me. I'm not, I'm not good at that. I, what yeah. I do is, uh, you know, I may have one of my uh, recruiters on a three-way with me and their prospect or, you know, allow them to hear both sides and sort of draw their own style. But I, in terms of creating a process where, you know, if they say this, you say that, and if they go this way, then you try to do this or try to go that way. It's, I'm not, I've never been able to break that down as well as you. You've, you've studied it. You've studied the human condition. You've studied the human behavior, responses, emotional um, response, how that makes somebody feel. Um, it's pretty impressive. When I was 24 at the age where you do know everything, yeah. I was a uh, naval officer, just finished my sea duty tour, and the Navy had an initiative in the early 90s called Total Quality Leadership, which was derived from W. Edwards Deming's concepts of total quality management. You see, at that time, Admiral Kelso, the chief of naval operations, knew that some of the traditions in the Navy weren't exactly healthy traditions, such as tailhook, and there had to be some change. And so I was on the front line. I got to be a trainer, Jim. I was a trainer at the world's largest naval base, teaching sailors, Marines, officer enlisted, senior enlisted, even civil service workers, how do you improve the quality of the work product? And so we studied what's called statistical process control. And Deming, he was an American consultant in the 1950s. He went to Japan. He taught the Japanese, especially the manufacturing, automotive manufacturing, how to manage. And his concepts gave birth to the global quality movement. That's what helped the Japanese get out of their recession, out of their depression after World War II and become a major global powerhouse of manufacturing. Well, those same concepts apply to any industry. And so I learned at a young age how do you measure things? And one example of that, and I found this, this is one of my tools, I'll just hold it up to the camera, that is a flow chart, a simple flow chart of a conversation. I have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a conversation. We use this within my own company. That's a classic. I create flow charts. I love that yeah, thing. Yeah, for, for conversations. Yeah. And what I'll even do with my own processes, I've got a process, and I'm, and I'm actually flowing out some processes right now with, I mean, simple things. When I have a new candidate that I'm onboarding, I'm gonna flow out that dialogue. He's already said yes, I need to flow it out. Tell me about this, this, and this. What if he says yes? What if he says no? Mm -hmm. Because anything that can be measured improves over time. So I learned it at that age when I was 24, and that has stayed with me. And I think that's one thing that was different about me as a trainer in the recruiting industry. No other trainer has written as much as I have, has been quoted as much as I have, has billed annual billing year. Nobody, no other trainers had the year I had two years ago. Nobody's understood the business this way. So if one person can do something, so can somebody else. Mm -hmm. I play a lot of golf. I'm a golf addict, Jim. I played over 300 rounds since COVID started. Oh my goodness. Handicaps. Thir yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a problem. Handicaps 13, but I only play nine whole rounds. So I'm home, you know, when I'm done and I'm getting better. And my coach, we, we would spend hours on the practice putting green, understanding the nuance and the subtleties of how do you hold the putter? How do you align it? How do you swing it? If one person can do something, so can somebody else. I become really good at putting because it doesn't require as much natural athleticism. Maybe I'm limited compared to the way I used to be or other people. But if one person can learn something and do something, so can somebody else. You just have to understand how do people think? What's their strategy, tactics? What sort of habits? What's their self-talk? You can replicate that stuff mm -hmm. so that's uh yeah and, and i love i love teaching people things how do you see recruiting uh, developing as we move forward now any anything different or do you see tech maybe playing less of a role in the phone coming back because you know with robo calling um i, I saw a study where somebody said um, 60 percent of people won't answer the phone if they don't recognize the number Back when you right. and I first started, right. everybody answered the telephone. Right. That's right. I think that 
it's people are going to get smarter. I think that it is more surgical, more uh, precise than shotgun. It is going to be more targeted. So for example, we subscribe to different data resources. Some of those data providers, I bring them on as strategic alliance providers where I can barter. I don't have to pay. I'm giving them visibility. They're giving me visibility. So I've, I've gotten pretty smart about that. But one of those does data within our niche, does artificial intelligence. So because of the data set that they've done research on, they can predict which people are more likely to leave based on certain attributes of trends of what causes people to leave in the past and all the data they've done. That's a unique tool. That's a, that's a pretty cool yeah, feature. Yeah. Predictive analytics is, is a big, is a yeah. big piece. So I think the sales skills will be as effective. I think, I think they're always going to be effective. I think once you get someone on the phone that is indicated they are open to moving, a lot of the hard work is done, but not all the hard work. And, and I would say there's two parts of it. One is getting those people to have that appointment, filtering it, researching it. We've got a research team. That's all they do. They spend all day. Average phone time is about six hours a day mm. talking to people just to set them up for myself and my colleagues, the other executives. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to pre-qualified prospects. We've, we've come up with a pretty good system, I think, that works. It's not. I didn't invent that. But I think using leverageable assets to get you in front of those people, I think also creativity and marketing and distinction. One thing I've done, like you alluded to, I produce a podcast called The Rainmaking Podcast. I like to speak at general business and corporate meetings on sales. That's great. That promotes that. But I recruit rainmaking partners. So I got tired of reading people that move to firms through somebody else. And I didn't, I didn't want to create an email newsletter because they'll unsubscribe and they'll tell me to quit spamming them. That's just not my niche. They're just not into that. Other niches they are. So I produce a podcast on client development because a partner in the firm, one of my candidates, he doesn't want to talk to me until he wants to move, but they care about getting new business all the time. So we're on episode like 80 something. Each week I have a different expert. So I'm able to use technology to get me leverage the byproduct of that is that, oh, yes, I've been invited to speak at legal conferences. Now I'm going to be on the stage in front of law firm clients. I'm doing a presentation for a global legal network because I've got credibility. Uh, even got invited to co-author a book called Rainmaker Confidential because, oh, they heard me on the podcast. Two of them were guests of mine. They're very successful authors. Henry DeVries, he has got a Forbes, col Forbes column, and Mark LeBlanc. So I think... Technology can give you a competitive advantage, but you have to be smart about it. Mm -hmm. You can't forego the thought of fundamentals of good business. I think some people think, oh, I love technology. And I, I don't think that's an effective approach. I love to win, and technology is a tool. I think it's good to have tech tools. You got to have them, but you can't get caught up in the love of technology and lose sight of the objective. Yeah, everybody's got tech, you know, so where's the di where's the difference there it, yeah. you've got to be able to make a difference somewhere and that comes from your skill set right if you're not working on your skill set absolutely right then you're not you're not really you're just sort of blending um yeah and then you become part of the noise right um like you said i, I like, like i like else. the i like the the term you used it's more surgical um yeah yeah that's uh, that's pretty interesting in terms of um industries that you see maybe moving forward over the next Oh, I don't know. Uh, it's 2022. Let's say over the next five to 10 years, any industries that you think might be changing or evolving to become less human uh, driven? Or do you see some industries that potentially are gaining steam could be potential hotbeds for recruiters? I think every, uh, well, I don't want to say every, I think retail, it depends. It's shifting. I mean, everybody knows what Amazon, Amazon has done and other delivery. Uh, I think there are shifts. It's kind of like when you think of water. Is that water really going down the drain? Are you losing it? No, it's going somewhere. It's going to evaporate. It's going to go in the clouds and it's going to come back down. We're not losing anything. Mm. It's just going to change. Mm -hmm. So I think paying attention to trends, 
when uh, the crisis hit, and I remember I had breakfast with a client of mine, it was whatever that Tuesday or Wednesday morning was in March, when everything shut down, I, I, I had a dinner to go to in Philadelphia. And I'm like, should I go to the dinner? I went to the dinner, I've got a client breakfast, we're going to meet in his office, his office is shut down. Mm-hmm. We met at the hotel restaurant where I was staying. And their firm had 22 global offices, and they were the first law firm to shut down all their offices. And so I remember having breakfast with them, and he's telling me about this, and I said, you set yourself up as a leader. Your firm made a decision. You were a leadership. Your leadership set a standard. So I think uh, the legal industry took a hit, but then what we saw were certain sectors, such as litigation, labor and employment, suits that would come from COVID, which obviously is going on now, with an insurance recovery, and then intellectual property on the patent prosecution, patent litigation within life sciences. So the crisis itself gave birth to opportunities. And I don't think not everybody was ready for that. Some people saw it coming and they were ready. So I think the water isn't going to disappear. It's just going to change form. Mm -hmm. I think when any industry goes through change, it's not going to disappear. It's just going to change priorities. I I'm speaking at a conference for people that recruits in hospitality in a couple of months and they've had to make some shifts and they've had to make some changes, but then all of a sudden they saw that there's an increase in demand for people that were doing delivery for restaurants. It shifted. The opportunity was there. And this reminds me that, and you've been through crises, we've been through all sorts of crises. And when you think about the things we've gone through as a society, we can't predict when that natural or man-made disaster is going to strike next. We just can't predict that. We had the global housing crisis. We had this healthcare crisis. They even tried to put Joni Loves Chachi back on the air, Jim. You know, there's some bad stuff going on out there. (laughs) But we have to be able to adapt. And what I learned after 9-11, I was recruiting in commercial construction. I'll never forget that changed everything overnight especially construction. That was my niche back then. All the projects dried up. Mm -hmm. And I did what my manager, Jim Vockley, told me. He said, uh, he always told me, document every conversation you have with everybody that's a VP and above as a hiring manager prospect. And once you got 50 of those, then call them all like every month and keep calling and keep calling them. So I would call everybody. And I remember after that happened, I was calling everybody and I found one firm that said, we have a problem. We can't fill these positions like, wow, tell me, what are they? They were for Walmarts. It was the only type of building going up. They were doing Walmart construction. And long story short, I found a vein of gold. And I built a lot that year in 2002. And at the end of that year, I said, I'm going to take what I've learned, and I'm going to put it in a bottle, and I'm going to sell it. It's going to be Brother Love's Recruiting Revival Traveling Tent Show. That was my training business. <laughs> that gave birth to my training business, because I learned how to bill and make a lot of money at a time when nobody else was. And part of it was the mindset that when things are going well, this is the pie. When things aren't going well, it's going to be like this, but it's still there. Yeah. It's going to go to somebody. Who's it going to go to? You have to make the decision. I'm, I choose to win. It's going to go to me. You've got to be a little bit better than your competition. Come in a little bit earlier. Stay a little bit later. Be smarter. Be sharper than them. Right. So I think there's going to be opportunities everywhere. It's just within each certain industry. You've got to see where is that trend going. There was one recruiting firm that they were talking with me about in construction after this current crisis. And I said, if I were you, I would look at reaching out to interior contractors. What sort of changes are they going to have to make in the workplace because of COVID? You know, who is going to have to adapt and get ahead of that curve? Position yourself before everybody else figures it out. Opportunity is always going to be there. Mm-hmm. So a couple of the industries that, that I've been looking at that I thought might make sense for recruiters to start maybe – uh, investigating would be robotics, uh, cybersecurity. That seems to be a big one. Um, but yeah, you're right. I love that analogy about the water. Uh, we're not yeah. losing it. It's just yeah. moving. It's going somewhere else, and it's going to change shape. Yeah, but it'll still be there. Yeah. And I think I think uh, even uh, you know getting into specific trends: fintech, cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. cybersecurity, obviously. Um, even the cupcake industry, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I saw the one that, that two NFL guys that started that cupcake company, uh, and they're wearing uh, pink aprons. <laughs> Have you seen that one? Oh, is that right? Yeah. No, oh, I yeah. Seen I'll that. send it to you. It's it's pretty it's pretty funny. My wife loves it. Yeah, uh, opportunities everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. So Scott, I I I can't thank you enough for being uh, making time out of your busy schedule to do this. I've wanted to do do this for a while. You've been um, somewhat of a mentor to me as well uh, when I first started out. So thank you for the positive influence that you've you've had on me and my career and my partners you, as Jim. well. Uh, it means a lot to us, and 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 more than that, the friendship that we've maintained over the years. It, it means quite a bit. So. Um, Fantastic. I know that we've called each other and pinged each other for advice from time to time, and it's an honor for me to to be able to answer some of the questions that you've had, and and you've always been there for me too. So, I hope our audience gets uh, gets a lot out of this. Uh, if you guys want to get some more information uh, from Scott, or maybe look at uh, engaging him for some for some speaking, uh, uh, we'll put his information on the screen as well, and how you can maybe check him out and at his websites. Uh, Outside of that, I, I just want to say thanks again, Scott. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure.